Okay, today our lesson is going to be about fibers and fiber analysis. We're going to be specifically thinking about this from a forensic standpoint, but before we can talk about how things are analyzed, we do need to understand what they are and where they come from. So you can kind of think of this as figuring out what is this stuff your clothes are made of. So when we look at clothing, um, clothing is made out of fibers, but what is a fiber? Well, a fiber can be natural or it can be synthetic. Um, natural sources and synthetic sources are quite different and we're going to be talking about both. Fibers are used to make clothing, fabrics, carpets, and other industrial materials. All of these substances can be sources for fiber evidence through shedding of the fibers from a surface and there we're applying Locard's theory of transference. Remember Locard's theory was the idea that every contact leaves a trace. Um, it's important to note that fibers are a type of class evidence. They are not considered individualizing because let's say we have a fiber from a red t-shirt. Well, there could be thousands of that particular red t-shirt that were sold through a business. So we can put them in a class, but we can't make them individualizing like DNA, for example. So a fiber is defined as the smallest unit of a textile material that has a length many times greater than its diameter. You can think of a thread being made out of fibers that are spun together. So a fiber can be spun with other fibers to, be form, sorry, to form a yarn that can then be woven or knitted to form a fabric. The type and the length of the fiber that is used and the type of spinning method and the type of fabric construction can all affect the transfer of fibers and the significance of those fiber associations. For example, let's say I have some really cheap towels that a friend gave me and those towels look great but when I use them I get covered in little puffs of fiber. Um, that's a function of the way the fabric is made. Okay, Tighter weaves tend to shed less. If you've ever worn a sweater over top of a shirt, you know that sometimes fibers can shed. So first let's talk about some natural fibers. Natural fibers are found in nature, and they're not generally altered by some chemical process other than coloring or dyeing in order to create a new color. So natural fibers can be dyed or colored. There are many types of dye processes and many different colors that natural fibers can take. What are some examples of some things you think might be natural fibers? Well, here's a list of a few. They include things like cotton, wool, linen, silk, ramy, sisal, which comes from a tree very similar to a coconut or a palm tree, jute, hemp, kapok, and core. Some of these are commonly used in clothing, like cotton, wool, linen, and silk, also ramy. But sisal, jute, hemp, kapok, and core are more commonly used in industrial products. Usually synthetic fibers are man-made fibers made from petroleum products, but they can be made from some natural byproducts as well. What are some types of synthetic fibers? Well, some common synthetic fibers are things like nylon. I had rayon here, but we actually put rayon in another group. Lycra, spandex, polyester, etc. There are lots of different synthetic fibers. Um, Dacrons, olefins, you might have heard of some of these. Our third class of fibers are reconstituted fibers. Reconstituted fibers are fibers like rayon and acetate, and they're called reconstituted because they come from a natural source, such as wood pulp, but they must be heavily chemically processed in order to turn them into a fiber. So without chemical intervention, they wouldn't exist, and that's why we put them in their own category. They start out as a natural material, but then are chemically processed to artificially produce a fiber. So now we're going to spend a little time talking about some individual types of fibers, and we're going to start with the most common fiber, in clothing and that is cotton. Here on the right you can see some cotton underneath a microscope. In this case you can see um, some highly magnified cotton fibers. They look flat and sort of um, like a twisted ribbon. Okay, 
So cotton is generally produced by a cotton plant in a structure called a bowl. Looks almost like a cotton puff. Um, that cotton bowl is spun and twisted after harvest and made to form a thread, which is then woven into a product. Now, oftentimes cotton threads can be identified by using the number of twists per inch in the thread. If we look, this particular thread diagram shows a six twist per inch thread with two separate fibers spun around each other to form that thread. Now, we can add many, many fibers together and make a rope okay, by twisting it on itself again. So this is a very common way that cotton can be used in an industrial setting. Our next fiber is wool. Now, where does wool come from? Well, the most common wool fibers originate from sheep. So they're basically the hair of a sheep. Now, the um, threads that I've shown you here, this wool, they've both been dyed. There are no naturally green or naturally red sheep, okay? Um, but something that's interesting about wool is the finer the fibers are, the smaller in diameter they are, the more likely they are to be used in clothing. And coarser fibers are oftentimes found in carpets. So the fiber diameter and the degree of scale protrusion on the fibers are important characteristics. This is something we're going to talk more about when we talk about hairs. Now, although sheep's wool is the most common form of wool, you can also get wool from other animals like camel, alpaca, cashmere, and mohair. Mohair happens to come from a goat. Now, this is a sheep. Um, that it's an interesting story. His name was Charlie. He escaped being sheared for I believe it was three years and when they finally caught him and sheared him he had quite a difference. Um, they got many, many many kilograms of wool from this one sheep. And you can see he looks uh, pretty happy to be rid of that, um, that wool pelt on the outside. Our next type of natural fiber we're going to talk about is silk. Silk is a natural fiber formed from the unwound cocoon of a silkworm moth. And um, it has no cell structure. It almost appears like a synthetic fiber when we look at it underneath the microscope. It's very easy to confuse with some synthetic fibers because of this. So silk comes from the silkworm moth. The silkworm looks kind of like this. And if we let it grow up, um, it eventually forms a chrysalis. That's what we see here. And the entire cocoon is made up of silk fibers. These silk fibers are then released and spun by heating the silkworm cocoons in boiling water. And that does two things. It kills the silkworms inside the cocoons. And it also releases the silkworm fibers, the silk fibers from the cocoons because they're in kind of a gluey, gummy substance and it breaks down that gum. Now if a silkworm were allowed to come to maturity, it would form a silkworm moth and they look kind of like this. I personally think they're kind of amazing looking. They're like if a puppy and a butterfly and a polar bear all came together and got super fancy and stuck feathers on their heads. That's what a silkworm moth looks like to me. Now, interestingly enough, um, most silk is produced in China. There is some trade in India, but the majority of silk comes from China because silkworms can only eat one thing, and that's mulberry trees. Believe it or not, on Long Island, there um, about a hundred years ago, there was a very, very fancy estate called Pepperidge. It was found in Oakdale. It was kind of between where um, Dowling College used to be the Vanderbilt Estate and the Bourne Estate, which is where um, LaSalle Academy used to be. This building actually no longer exists. It was torn down um, in the 1940s. There's actually quite a tragedy attached to it. The builder of this building um, built it for his bride and when she left him and for a younger man, he actually um, committed suicide in his apartment in New York City. And no one ever actually lived in the chateau. And you might be wondering, well then why are you bringing it up? Because about 50 years later, um, a young man 
thought he was going to start farming farming silk on Long Island and he filled the building with mulberry trees and started trying to grow them there and it absolutely didn't work. Linen is another form of natural fiber. It comes from the fibers and stems of the flax plant. And if you look here at this example, you can actually see the cell walls in these pieces of fiber. And that makes sense because it comes from the stems of a plant. So in order to get the linen um, out of the flax plant, it has to go through a pretty complex process. The stems of the plant are broken down physically through a process called redding, which is like rotting, and something called hackling. So um, because it's made of plant cells, we can see those cell wall divisions in the fibers when we put them under magnification. So how do we get from linen, or sorry, from flax to linen? Well, the flax is grown in the field and then is pulled up and put into bundles. Those bundles are then laid in a pond or in a stream to be constantly covered by water and the outer covering of the stem rots away. After that outer stem is rotted away, the fibers are separated from one another by running them over a very kind of nasty looking tool called a hackle. It's basically a hairbrush made out of nails. You definitely wouldn't want to get too close to that. And once that's done, the fibers are separated into this kind of golden colored, um, almost looks like straw, but it's very, very fine. And that is the linen fibers, which can then be woven into a fabric. Rayon and acetate are our two main reconstituted fibers. How are they made? Well, in the production of rayon, we have purified cellulose or wood pulp, and it's chemically converted into a soluble compound. Oftentimes, this is dissolved in something like acetone. Um, this compound is then passed through a spinneret, which hardens the fibers in the air, and then they can be spun together. If you look here, you can see there's a pattern of ridges on the outside surface of the um, reconstituted fibers and that's because that pattern was in the spinneret. We s will also see this in our synthetic fibers. So our nylons, polyesters, and other synthetics. First thing I want to discuss, polyesters and nylons are the most commonly encountered man-made fibers. These are closely followed by acrylics but all of them are spun through spinnerets in order to form them, which often leaves the shape of the quote-unquote die on the shape of the finished fiber. If you look here, I've got some yellow fibers and some red fibers. The red ones are what we call a tribe-lobed shape or a triangle shape. The yellow fibers are round. Those shapes are completely a function of the shape of the die that the um, liquid polymers that form the fibers were pushed through. If when you were little, if you had a Play-Doh set up that had like a little squeezy thing that you could squeeze your Play-Doh -Play through and make it into all different shapes, that's kind of like a very crude version of this spinneret. If we look at the fiber on the bottom, you can see once again we have this trilobed shape and it actually creates a natural twist in the fiber as it's formed. So how does this work? Well, if we are in a factory, you have something like this. Here's our liquid polymer. It gets pumped through a spinneret. That spinneret has a specific shape that determines the shape of our fiber. It's blasted with cold air in order to solidify it, and then it can be spun onto a um, spindle in order to be packaged and then used. Spandex and Lycra are their own special class of synthetic fibers, and we put them in their own group because they have the ability to stretch. They can be stretched repeatedly and still recover their shape. Um, it's not infinite. They can't be shape, sorry, stretched an infinite number of times and go back to shape, but we can get pretty close. Generally, they can be stretched more than 500 times without breaking, and they're stronger and more durable than natural rubber. They were developed in the 20th century as a replacement for rubber in things like elastic bands. These are still derived from petroleum, and because of this, they will break down under exposure to heat and some salts, which is the reason why 
If you've ever worn a bathing suit through an entire summer season, oftentimes they get stretched out of shape by the end of the season because the chlorine salts in the swimming pool and the sodium chloride in the in ocean water all serve to break down the spandex and lycra that make the bathing suit stretchy. So that's it for our fibers. Um, thanks a lot.